So I Googled GMOs and then I went to the images tab and this is a very typical representative image of what I found, right? It's some sort of sterile situation where we're injecting a tomato there. We got the gloves on and right. It seems very clinical and um, sciency, right? What, what's the validity of this? Is, is this how GMOs work? Is this how we get GMOs? Um, or is this a scare tactic? So in this video, I'm hoping to explain a bit about what GMOs are. And in the second part of the vi video, we're gonna talk about organic farming, what that's all about, okay? So let's go ahead and get started. So to understand GMOs, we really have to understand this idea of artificial selection, right? You've probably heard of natural selection, right? Nature is selecting what traits evolve. Artificial selection is when humans are involved, right? We are artificially selecting certain traits to move into the next generation. We may also call this selective breeding. That's when humans are intervening in evolution. So take, for example, all of these vegetables, right? The cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, kale. We have selectively breeded all of these through the generations from this wild mustard plant, right? These are all in the brassica family. So we had this plant and over time, right? If one had this sort of bigger, fluffier bud, right? We selected that, bred it again, and we got broccoli today. Same thing with cauliflower, right? If you think of the flower, that's the flowering part. These terminal leaf buds from the brassica plant, um, we selected for cabbage and then the leaves for kale. So humans have been doing this for generations, right? We've been selectively breeding. We've been taking select organisms and then breeding them to get different traits to be expressed, right? This, it's the same way we got a Chihuahua and a Great Dane all from its ancestor, the wolf, right? We have selectively bred these animals. The bigger ones in the litter, we bred over time. Over time, those big ones, right? They're the Great Dane. Maybe some of the runts of the litter, we kept breeding the runt of this litter and the runt of that litter and, and this one that had this particular facial feature. And then we got different dogs that looked like that. So we have been selectively breeding organisms for many, many years. So what does this look like? Well, let me give you a very prime example. So here we see modern day corn, but how did we get this? Well, it actually is from this teosinte, which we have selectively bred for these particular kernels over time, right? So it was this, and then we bred it into this, and then finally, right, the corn that we see today. So how does this happen? How have we selectively bred plants and animals throughout history. Well, one way, of course, is to consider something called cross-pollination. Now, in this example, you see a bee doing it, but we, if we're doing it as humans, we do something similar. But I use this image just to show you how this works, right? So we've got one flower here, we've got a flower, different flower there. So as you know, um, plants reproduce sexually, much like animals. And so what you see here is that there's a male and a female part. So if you look here, the stamen is the male part and it has a filament and these anthers. And if you look here on the anther, you see all the pollen, right? Think of pollen as sort of like the sperm of the plant world. Well, how do plants get pollinated? Well, of course, right, you might, you might have some pollinating insect like a bee. It comes and it gets a little bit of the pollen and then it comes over to this plant and happens to drop it in the female part, right? The stigma, which includes the ovule and ovary. And that um, sperm or that pollen pollinates and we get some of these traits, right? Some of the DNA from this plant transferred to this plant. Same way humans reproduce, right? Some DNA from one person goes to the DNA and joins with the DNA of another person. Now, bees do this naturally, but humans, if we were to take and maybe use like a little, a little paintbrush there, take some of this pollen and specifically transfer it over to another plant, we can breed selectively, meaning, oh, 
this tomato plant or this corn plant is really bigger than the others. I'm going to take some of the pollen from this flower and then pollinate this other one that I like the trait and we'll breed it selectively. Okay, so we've done this throughout history. Humans have been selectively breeding plants and animals for generations. In fact, um, the, this um, is an image I found of some of the first seeds that were cross-pollinated, right? So Garton's agricultural plant breeders in England were really the first to commercialize these agricultural crops to grow through cross-pollination, right? So they were in their little laboratory, right, or on the farm, and they were cross-breeding these plants, and they were finding that these hybrids, right, a, a breed across between two, um, were better. Maybe they lasted longer. Maybe they tasted better. Maybe they were bigger. And so they were some of the first group to start selling these. And if you look, you can sort of see the date 1902, right? So we've been doing this for many, many years. So if you were um, trying to select some traits that we wanted in our crops, um, what would you include? Well, one thing that's super important in our world is nutrition, right? Why do we eat? We eat for nutrition. So if we could somehow find some plants to cross that were more nutritious, that'd be a good trait that we should get. Um, and then I really like this idea of improved flavor, right? This is a trait in a plant that I want, right? I want, the, I want it to taste good. Um, we also, right, might want greater beauty. Now these are some plastic looking ones, right? But you can see they're very bright. They're very beautiful to the eye. And so, believe it or not, a lot of farmers are now growing crops just because they appease our eye. Um, and then another big one is in increased yield of the crop. If we're growing a bunch of wheat or corn, we want a big yield from that crop. We want a lot to take. So if some crops produce more yield, that's the one we want to go with. Um, and then, you know, because of climate change and all the stuff going on in our atmosphere, we want some crops that actually have increased tolerance, right? So they can, they can withstand drought and extreme temperatures. If we were designing a good plant, we'd also want it to be resistant to viruses, fungi, and bacteria. Every year, my garden, um, it seems like I get I, it, the tomato plants or the green beans, they catch something. This year, my tomatoes caught a lot of tomato blight, which is a fungus, right? So when I get tomatoes next year, some seeds, I'm really going to look like, are some of them a little more resistant to tomato blight than others? Those are the ones I might plant. Um, we also want some plants that are going to be tolerant to insect pests, right? Insects get on your plants and they eat all the fruit. Well, if you don't want that, maybe we could have a plant that has a trait to make it resistant to those pests. And a newer one is we might want some crops that are resistant or increased tolerance to herbicides, right? An herbicide is like something you might spray to kill the weeds. But if you're spraying to kill the weeds in the crop area and it gets on some of the actual vegetables that you want, oh, that's not good. But what if the vegetable or the fruit was resistant to that particular herbicide that we were spraying, okay? And then, especially when we need to move things to grocery stores and to farmer's markets, we want those crops to last a long time, so longer storage period. So these are all traits that we have selected for over generations and that we continue to desire. We call them favored traits. Now, how, how do we get these, right? We can do some selective breeding, but is there another way? Well, that brings us to modern day plant breeding, okay? So we are using modern techniques of biology to modify or insert some of those desirable traits we just talked about into plants. So one way we do that is by creating what we call a transgenic plant. That means trans other, so there are genes from another plant that have been inserted into this plant. So for example, we see here, right, we're actually changing the structure of the DNA. So if, for example, we had these original blue flowers and we wanted it to be yellow, we could take some of the DNA, insert a different gene to cause it to be yellow, and in this case, looks maybe bigger, all right? So one way is to create a transgenic plant by putting 
different DNA into already existing plants. Another a little more complicated way to do this is to create a transgenic plant by turning off some unfavorable traits. So instead of inserting favorable genes, sometimes we just turn off bad genes, right? Or genes that we don't really want. And modern science um, helps us with this a lot. This is something which we call genetic regulation or genetic control. And we can do this to like uh, reduce some allergens in tomatoes, right? If there's a certain uh, protein being made in tomatoes that is uh, causing some allergic reactions in some people, well, why don't we just turn off the gene that makes that protein? How do we do that? Well, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. Um, we, we do it something called, with something called RNA silencing. So basically, you may remember the central dogma of biology, which says DNA goes into RNA, and then RNA codes for protein, right? So this critical step in the center, RNA, um, looks like what you have here. So let's say this is target mRNA, meaning this is one that's going to make a bad protein. Well, what we can do is we can create some miRNA or some siRNA that matches the sequence. So notice this sequence of that fits right on there. It latches on and then it signals for degradation, right? So this RNA will never get made into that protein, which is what is causing the allergen or causing the increased fungal growth on some corn, okay? So we can add a favorable gene, we can silence an unfavorable gene, and then another common thing we do today is improve photosynthesis. So you probably remember photosynthesis is the process by which the, the plant uses the sun's energy to um, grow, to create sugar, to get energy, and then of course it releases oxygen for us. Well, one interesting thing that happens in plants is plants have a property which is called non-photochemical quenching. And what that means is when there's a lot of sun, when there's a lot of light, plants can sort of shut down the process of photosynthesis so that they don't get scorched, right? They don't want too much sun so they can shut it down. Well, the shutting down process of photosynthesis is pretty quick, but turning it back on when it needs to make photo, to do photosynthesis again is a little more laggy, right? It takes a little more time. So one of the things that we can do is turn off this non-photochemical -photo quenching, which turns off photosynthesis. So in other words, if we're turning off the thing that turns off photosynthesis, we are in essence keeping photosynthesis on, okay? And what we found is that results in um, a big increase in yield on the plant, bigger leaves, more mass in the plant, okay? So these are three sort of modern plant breeding techniques. Now I'm gonna walk you through really what's going on here, okay? So conventional breeding, which is like what we've done before, I've talked about, you know, when humans, farmers throughout generations have done this. What they do is they take a current cultivar, meaning the plant that's sort of currently used. And then we find this sort of wild type or this one that's different, but it's got this gene that we like, okay? The blue part right here is the beneficial genes, but we don't want all this other stuff. We want the other stuff from these chromosomes. I should have told you, I should have led with this, right? Here's the two chromosomes of this plant. Here are the two chromosomes of this plant. So these are the beneficial genes. The red part's unwanted. So what we do is we cross these, right? And what we get, as you see, is in the offspring, right? We got some that are like the original parents, but we got some that are a hybrid of the original that we then cross again. We do what's called a back cross. And if you do this many, 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 many times, and you keep selecting for the gene we want, right? You've got these genes being the new ones that we wanted integrated into the old gene for the old plant, okay? That's how this has been done over generations. Now, what can we do today? We can do transgenesis meaning we can take some gene from an unrelated organism, right? So we can take a gene from a green bean, that's good, and put that gene in a plant, right? Let's say the green bean was resistant to this pest. 
and that's a good gene, we take it and we put it over in a tomato, right? So that's transgenesis moving from one organism to another. So there's our beneficial gene. How do we do this? Well, it's a little more complicated. What we actually have to do is use molecular biology to take that gene and insert it into a plasmid. A plasmid is just a circular piece of DNA. And we use plasmids and put them in a specific bacteria called agrobacterium. That gene then is introduced directly into the chromosomes of the plant, okay? That's called transgenesis. And I'm gonna give you a little more detail on how that process is done using a bacterium. So what we do is we insert into plant genomes using a bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens. So here's the process on how it works. It looks a little complicated, but I think you can understand it. All right, so here's my bacterium, right? Here's some of its DNA. Here is a plasmid. So this bacteria has this plasmid. It's called the tDNA plasmid. And this is what we call a shuttle vector, right? So it shuttles DNA into different organisms. Okay, so we take that plasmid out of the bacterium. Now we've got it. So in the lab, we cut that plasmid open using some restriction enzymes, okay? Those enzymes cut it open, and now we can take a fragment of DNA that we want, right? This is our special gene that we want to introduce, and we can actually insert that into the plasmid, right? So we now have this circular piece of DNA that's got the gene that we want. Well, now we take that and we put it back in the bacteria. So then we take that bacteria and introduce it to plant cells. Well, what we know is because this is a shuttle vector, this plasmid often gets incorporated into the plant cell's chromosomes. So we now have the chromosomes of the plant that have this new gene inserted. So then we take those cells, we culture them, then we take these cells and then plant them, grow a new plant. This plant now has the gene that we inserted, right? And we talked about all those things those genes might be, right? Increased flavor, increased nutrition, ability to reject pests or herbicides. So this is one of the modern ways that we can modify plant genes using a bacteria. Okay, so let me give you some examples of what these genes that we're inserting could do. Um, in this example, right, we are helping a plant, here's a peanut plant, become resistant to some of these little insects. Um, in this case, it's a corn stalk borer insect that causes a lot of damage. So you can see the damage that it's causing. Well, this peanut plant down here has been in, um, modified, right? It's a recombination, and it has a gene which makes a protein toxic to these insects, right? So these insects, these borers, are not going to be eating that leaf because they get sick. So we don't have to necessarily now spray a bunch of synthetic chemicals on this to keep the insects off because it's naturally producing that herbicide. Um, and you've probably heard of Roundup a lot. Um, Roundup Ready plants are plants manufactured. Um, they have a gene, and um, this is from a company, Monsanto, you've probably heard a lot about. And basically, these plants, are they have the gene, so they're not hurt by the herbicide glyphosate. And there's the chemical formula for that. Now, what does this do? Well, what this does, if you think about it, is if I've got a crop that is not hurt by this herbicide, I can just spray Roundup and kill all the weeds and everything else around it. So everything dies except the crop, right? So all these weeds aren't using up all the nutrients from the ground. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention Roundup in particular, right? There's a lot of news about this. Um, some, there are claims that it's linked to cancer. So um, I'm in no way promoting and saying, right, this is a, um, an amazing company or anything, right? That's, that's up for you sort of to decide. But 
it in theory it's an interesting idea if we could create herbicides that don't kill the crops but they kill the weeds then we then we've done good for yield okay the other thing that these genes could do is increase stress tolerance by inserting genes which make transcription factors to regulate gene expression now that's a mouthful right but if you've taken a biology class you may remember there are certain things called transcription factors. Transcription factors make transcription occur. And transcription is just the process of making RNA from DNA. So when we do this, we make the RNA, that will go off and make a protein. That protein might help us be more tolerant to stress, okay? So by adding these transcription factors to turn on transcription, make these proteins to be less, um, that, that help with the stress tolerance, we're in essence increasing the yield for these plants. Okay, and as I mentioned, improving photosynthesis is another thing that's commonly done. You may remember from your biology class that chloroplasts and mitochondria, they have their own DNA, right? So if you look at chloroplasts, it has its own DNA that's not in the nucleus of the plant. So one thing scientists do is try to modify these chloroplasts because that is the site of, of course, photosynthesis. And one way we can do it is, as I've mentioned, is turning off that non-photochemical quenching. So photosynthesis just doesn't turn off. It keeps going and going and going. So more photosynthesis, more plant. Okay. So I want to tell you about a few sort of successful GMOs, um, and then we'll talk about some criticism. So here's a few success stories. Golden rice was a genetically modified organism where we inserted a gene to produce beta carotene, which is of course a precursor to vitamin A. So in a lot of parts of the world, right, there's nutrient deficiency. I think that's an important term to think about, nutrient deficiency, meaning some groups, some places in the world don't get the nutrients they need. Well, one thing that scientists have done is they have inserted a gene, right, which activates a multi-step pathway, which essentially increases the amount of beta carotene. And we know beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. So this helps a lot of people with their vitamin A deficiency if they eat the sort of golden rice, okay? Now, there's been studies on whether or not this has truly increased beta carotene in populations, um, and some of those studies are mixed. But in the theory, the idea is that if we could actually increase nutrients in our plants, um, then we can really help a lot of people. Another really interesting success story is um, BT cotton. So this is in engineered, excuse me, to produce an insecticide to combat these boll worms. You see these boll worms? Well, they would craw crawl all over the cotton and, you know, just ruin it. Well. Now, the cotton has been engineered to produce a chemical, an insecticide, to kill these worms, right? So the cotton itself is making the chemical to kill the worms. Um, Arctic apples are really interesting. You know, if you think about it, you cut open an apple, you open it up, what happens? Well, it starts to brown, right? So it's not very appealing. It may change the flavor a bit. So some apples now have genes inserted to stop an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase, which increases the browning, right? So you, if you stop the enzyme, then it doesn't convert one chemical into this sort of brownish color, and therefore our, our apples stay fresher longer. And then you may have heard about soybean. In fact, 80% of the soybean that we grow in the United States um, and globally um, is genetically modified, right? So it has become resistant. We've modified it to become resistant to some herbicides so that when we spray, it doesn't kill the soybean, and then we can use that soybean for many things. Okay, so benefits. Um, um, when I was doing some research on this, I found a really interesting 2014 meta-analysis, which just means a big study that looks at lots of different other studies, concluded that GMOs, genetically modified organisms, reduce chemical pesticide use by 37%, right? That's less spraying, less synthetic things we have to put on our plants. And increase the crop yield, 
by 22%, okay? Subsequently doing that increases farmers' profits by using GMOs, right? So there's some clear benefits to the use of genetically modified organism. Well, to be fair, I also want to introduce a few potential concerns. There are some concerns about superbugs, right? So that looks like a scary little bug there. The idea is if we keep making genetically modified plants that are resistant to bugs, well, bugs evolve, don't they, right? So if the bugs, the insects, keep evolving to be able to eat, we're in essence creating these super bugs that have evolved that will evade all of our herbicides and our genetically modified plants. Another thing is super weeds, right? So again, if we are spraying all these chemicals on these plants that are resistant to that chemical, well, the weeds eventually are gonna evolve and be resistant to that chemical as well. So we would call those super weeds. Many people are also concerned that, okay, we're putting genes into DNA. What if this new gene causes an allergy in someone, right? There haven't really been any studies to show that this happens, but it is a potential concern we gotta think about. And then another concern is loss of biodiversity. You may remember from biology class that biodiversity is important. We need to have lots of different kinds of crops, lots of different kinds of life to sustain um, um, life on our planet. So if we're continually only using these GMO plants, what does that do to biodiversity, okay? So even though I've mentioned these concerns, I do think it's important to tell you and remind you there's broad scientific consensus that GM crops pose no greater risk to human health than conventional food, okay? So that's just the science. Um, study after study after study has looked. In fact, the GM crops are probably studied more than traditional crops because, right, these manufacturers are so worried about a potential flaw, so they really, really study them. And there is broad scientific consensus that um, these GM crops actually pose no greater risk to human health than the normal traditional crops. Okay, I wanna end this video by talking, by sort of switching to another side, all right? So you hear a lot about GMOs, and you probably hear a lot about organic food, right? Some people only wanna buy organic food. Well, what does that mean? Well, we know in science, organic just means carbon, right? If you're studying organic chemistry, we're just talking about carbon. But in modern day vernacular, organic farming has come to mean farming that uses fertilizers that are organic in nature, meaning stuff that was living that then helps grow the plant. So basically the idea is non-synthetic, right? So things that we didn't make in a lab. So organic farming uses compost, manure, bone meal, okay? And instead of using synthetic pesticides, they're, they're using more biological pest control, right? So introducing some insects to kill the, the worms that are eating the plant or specific companion planting, planting one plant next to another to help keep some pests away. So. Here are two examples. <clears throat> this is an aphid which tears up crops. And some people are introducing this um, Sarpus hoverfly to actually feed on those, right? So this doesn't damage the plant. This does, well, but if this is eating that, then we don't have to worry about it damaging. And then a lot of people in the organic community, farming community, especially if it's a smaller garden, um, like to introduce ladybugs because the ladybugs also will eat those aphids and help protect the plant from other insects, okay? So organic really is about not using synthetic fertilizers, not using synthetic chemicals to spray on these plants. Well, sounds great, right? But, well, what's some criticism of that, right? We want to be fair. Well, what some analyses show is that Organic substances like milk, cereals, pork, actually put off more greenhouse gas, right? More CO2 emissions, more methane. And so as we looked at in our last video in this series, right, climate change is a big deal. Um, consequently, beef and olives had lower emissions, so that's really interesting. 
But when you think about the global greenhouse gas emissions, agriculture and land use really put out quite a bit of greenhouse gases, which is, of course, warming up our planet. Okay, another criticism is that it, we just don't get the same yield, meaning organic requires a lot more land, often a lot more base carbon fertilizer. And um, a meta-analysis done concluded that organic raised food requires roughly 84% more land for the same yield. So to get, you could use this or this, this one has to be used if you're, make, if you're doing organic agriculture. That's using a lot more land. Therefore, we're not getting as much crop to feed people. Um, and then I want to end with this idea. Several studies show that insufficient evidence is to be found that organic food is safer or better tasting, right? There's really never been any conclusive study to say organic is safer, organic tastes better, etc. Now, of course, you as a human have the right to eat what you want, but you should know, according to the science, you're really just paying more for food that's not safer or not better tasting. Now, if you have ethical issues about way animals are treated or crops are treated, of course, you make decisions for you, but you should know the science is there that organic food is not really any better for you than others. Okay, so these are two hot topic issues, GMOs, organic agriculture. Hopefully this podcast, this video helped you um, sort of put these in a mental framework to understand them and make your own decisions about what you eat.